Hey, welcome back to Volumes. In this episode, I spoke with Clara Robb on what it's like living with Crohn's. Thanks for watching. Let's just jump right in. So do you want to introduce yourself and explain the wide list of things that are wrong with you? <laughs> I am Clara. Um, when I was 14, I was diagnosed with um, inflammatory bowel disease indeterminate, which is basically when... Doctors can't really tell the difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Okay. And what one do you have? Well, I, don't, I still don't know. Like, I'm you don't know? I'm 22 now and I still don't know. So basically, you can have both. Like Basically, the thing is, um, so Crohn's can affect anywhere from your mouth to your anus. And usually it's like, it affects like deeper into the actual like tissue. Right. Whereas ulcerative colitis is only your large intestine. Right, okay. And like ulcerative colitis is usually more like symptoms like bleeding and stuff like that. Right, this is this is like such a curveball right now. So you don't actually know exactly what it is you have. It could be one of those two things. Yeah, I mean, it could be one of those two or both, essentially. It's like, because when I was diagnosed, there was my entire large intestine was like, terribly inflamed and right. then a small bit of my at the end like see the terminal ileum it's like the end of your small intestine that was also very inflamed so they're not i mean i think that they're <coughs> leaning more towards ulcerative colitis nowadays but they're not really quite sure yet right okay just because like ulcerative colitis normally isn't as severe i mean it is still a severe illness but it's not normally as severe like inflammation in the intestine is what i suffer from Right, and like you said, you said that you can't eat just anything. You can't just eat an abundance of like any choice of food. You need to really pick and choose what you eat, right? I mean, like it's not so much for me. And I, I know other friends of mine who have Crohn's and stuff. They have certain trigger foods. So say, like one of my friends, if she eats like fruit that has like skins or anything like that, like that can. What? I mean, it can, like, instantly trigger her having to, like, go to the bathroom. But I don't really... I find coffee is probably, like, the only thing for me that really right. messes with me. Even decaf a wee bit sometimes. Um, but I, I've tried a few different diets in terms of when I was, I think, about 15. For, like, two years, I did, like, the paleo diet. What's that? Well, essentially, you just don't eat anything, like, that wouldn't have existed, like, post-caveman times. So <laughs> it's like you eat, like, meat not a certain few grains and like fruit and veg that's like it so i did right. that for like two years and which, did that make any difference oh i was that was yeah. actually the, like the best time of my life like it was probably like my health then i think i only had like one tiny flare up then um and then like last year like i had an absolute like nightmare of a year like it was a total mess and then i went vegan in April, just like April 2018, mm-hmm. which I think is like that in combination with like new treatments, like I do think it's helped quite a lot. So when you say like when it becomes inflamed, like how does that actually affect you? Is so, it intense pain or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a lot of different things. So I, I mean, it's quite varied. Like I suffer like a lack of appetite. So I probably, like, there's some, when I was, the f- worst flare up I've had, I think, like in terms of the intensity rather than like the duration of it because last year the duration of it was quite bad but when I was like 14 and I was first diagnosed that was when I was definitely like at my most unwell and um, I just stopped eating for like nearly two weeks or something I couldn't eat at all Um, and then obviously like with my condition like because of like the bleeding that you have coming from your intestine you need to use the bathroom like up to 30 times a day sometimes it's like just blood yeah like, it's very bad so basically it just really sucks like, oh. it's just awful <laughs> yeah. it's not fun yeah Jeez, oh. loads of kind of different symptoms as well like because you're not absorbing nutrients as well properly so you get quite malnourished like tiredness like i still suffer from really bad like lack of concentration and stuff a lot um and like so how do you actually treat it? Is there medication that you're on? Or? Yeah. So the cause, the the main cause is um, your immune system effectively is attacking your digestive system. I still don't think like scientists are like sure, like yeah. they don't really, they're not really sure like 100% why it happens. Like, But 
obviously to counteract that you can take drugs that like suppress your immune system okay. so at the doesn't minute, that just open you up to like disease and stuff as yeah well, that's like that is another like big issue like so i've never had surgery a lot of like a few of my friends have had surgery one of my friends had uh, her Crohn's only affected like a small portion of her small intestine right. so they just sort of like removed that bit and stitched the other two ends back together so like go and, go and explain that again right, so they just cut <laughs> out this portion of the skin of her actual small uh, intestine and and then just kind of like and then they shortened just, it oh essentially. yeah essentially like you can do that but because mine affects my entire large intestine right. if I have surgery it means that I'll have to have the entire large intestine roof which would then mean you would have like a colostomy Could you, bag oh okay so they can't like create like a synthetic one or anything they like can that. create this they do this thing called j-pouch surgery <laughs> which is sort of like creating like a pouch inside you but there is like i think a 50 50 chance that that can get infected and right. the only way to cure that is to take this like um antibiotic that completely clears out your system of like all bacteria and then you have to take like probiotics to like build it back up again. So it's just right. like it's not something I would want to consider. Nah, I, I think I was told last year I would probably need surgery, and I was considering just going for a colostomy bag. But I've which is when you basically your digestive system is almost outside your body. Yeah, yeah, effectively for me it would just be like removing the large intestine, and then you would just empty that instead of like using the toilet. Right. But um, at the minute, like I've tried. So my medication, when I was first diagnosed, usually for like the short term, though you'll be given like steroids, so like corticosteroids, um, and you're only meant to be on them for like eight weeks maximum. Um, so I was I tried those that didn't really work that well, and I was given something called cyclosporin, right. which is a drug used for people who have had kidney transplants to like right. suppress their immune system so it's like mega strong really bad side effects you take like blood tests every week so that that was just for the short term and then i was started on a drug called azathioprine which, how do you remember all these because names? they're like oh i've been on them so many times so azathioprine's like sort of uh it takes sort of like three months to build up in your system so um I, I was I was started on like the cyclosporin and steroids for the short term till the azathioprine built up and I was in azathioprine like I'm still, I still am on that as well but right. it kind of managed my condition pretty well for a few years it has some side effects but nothing like too bad in terms of like sensitivity to light is one of them like sunlight you need to like I used to have quite like um shallow skin when I was younger like as a child but azathioprine kind of like I think stops it makes you like sensitive to sunlight and stops your body producing as much melanin I think so right. you can develop like skin cancers and things you need to be quite careful about like going in the sun so basically this doesn't even cure it it just it just helps keeps, yeah it just and helps. then in return yes. <laughs> you become completely open to almost every other yeah. disease and yeah there's a chance a small chance like I, I mean my nurse I, I've got a specialist nurse and right. she says of all the patients that she's had on these drugs none of them have ever developed lymphoma but there is like a small chance that you can mm -hmm. develop lymphoma from taking these drugs but the way i see it is kind of it's like a small price to pay in terms of this like the stuff i suffered last year for like an entire year uh you know it's like a, a, you have to like weigh it up is it worth mm -hmm. is it worth it and like i think yes for me at the minute yeah so are you born were you born with this or was this see, something that developed my if mom says mom says when i was like young i suffered um i mean it's quite complex because they don't know a lot of it's like they think it's genetic but no one in my family has anything like this my mom says when i was younger i used to suffer terribly from like nausea and things right. like that when she took me to the doctor they diagnosed it as tummy migraines <laughs> <laughs> but she was like never really sure like what was going on but she thinks maybe like I seemed apparently very chilled out as a child, but she thinks I might have been quite anxious about like going mm. to school and things. Um, and Crohn's is like stress related. If I get stressed out, for instance, my flare up last year started when I was starting uni for the first right. time, really. So it is like all sort of related to that. So I just need to be careful about getting stressed mm. out and things. But um, 
obviously I stopped I still take the azathioprine but that kind of stopped working last year as well like it was a combination of things I started uni I was like really stressed about like that and moving and that kind of thing like yeah. and I mean usually with like medications for Crohn's they do stop working after a few years and I think I've been taking it for like eight years or something at that point six years eight years so then I was started on this drug called infliximab so that basically it's a biological therapy I think they have like five different biological therapies that what they does can that use. Mean? So I think it's something to do with like mouse cells. Like I think it's developed from mouse cells in Fliximab. But like uh, it binds to a certain protein in your intestine that causes inflammation. But for me that means that you can't like it's not tablets, you need to go and get that intravenously. Right. So I need to go into hospital every six weeks for like a few hours and get that. Um, and obviously you're not gonna, but if you miss that, what happens? Like, we the see the thing is in the in the lead up to your next infusion is what they call it. Uh-huh. You start feeling unwell again. Right. So like I, I'm due my next infusion this Thursday, so I'm just kind of starting to not feel the best again this right. week. And it's just not ideal as well because like I need to like put holidays in for work because I it flattens you like you yeah. end up it's like flu symptoms almost after getting it. So like joint pain, that kind of thing. And this is how how often do you say that was? Every, every six weeks. Every six weeks, like forever. I mean, yeah, that's that, that's a plan. But I mean, there is obviously always the chance that it stops working again. Um, it stops working again. I mean, yeah, like because most Crohn's medications, like right. after a few years, will just like stop working. It's annoying. And how long have you been on that? Just since not like January or the previous January before that right. but it honestly did not work for me until I was really unwell up until about September I was and I was actually taking steroids for the entire year like you know they meant to win steroids for eight weeks and I was on like steroids for an entire year which honestly has been absolutely horrendous like I gained three stone in about six months like it's, it's honestly had so many bad effects if it stops working, what what do you do next? Well, is I there think, just another drug and then another drug and then. Well, I think there's about four other types of biological therapy you can try, but if not, I mean, eventually, like it would be surgery just to like remove your intestine, which at the minute I don't really want that because it's like you obviously need to. There's a lot of care that comes with having a colostomy mm-hmm. bag. Like you you need to empty them quite a few times a day. It's not just like it's not like as freeing as you would think it would be, mm-hmm. um, and they can leak in things like that, which would obviously not be ideal. Yeah. But I mean, obviously, if it was getting to the stage where you were really unwell every single mm-hmm. day and there wasn't any more like medication that you could try, then I obviously would go for it. But right now, it would not be my choice. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. And you said you're going to Spain. Yes. So then, because of as of this treatment you're getting right now, yeah, you'd have to come back every four weeks. Four weeks. Yeah. So I mean, I didn't even. So I started university. I, my main degree program was English literature, but I've always studied Spanish alongside mm-hmm. that, and like I actually really prefer Spanish to English literature. So I honestly didn't even think that I'd be able to do the year abroad next year, which you need to, it's compulsory if you're doing a Spanish degree. But having spoken with you and they were like, yeah, you could just do that and get treatment in Spain. But having spoken with my doctors, they said that I can't get the treatment in Spain because I think it's too expensive. It costs about like 30 grand a year per patient or something. And the NHS wouldn't fund me to do that. Yeah. And obviously I couldn't afford like travel insurance for mm-hmm. that amount. So it is going to involve me coming back every four weeks for two weeks because you need to get blood tests and stuff done before it too. Right. Which is going to be a lot of money. I'm just hoping that there's like some kind of funds or you know something that I can apply for. Yeah. So how much is like this? Seems like it's completely changed your life since yeah. the, like knowing you've had this. Yeah. Especially I think because I was so lucky from I was obviously very unwell when I was first diagnosed I think that was about how did you find out well I'd actually been suffering symptoms it was kind of like blood and things when I went to the toilet for about four months and obviously at that age like I was 13 14 I think mm-hmm. I'd just turned 14 um I was like really embarrassed about it didn't really want to say to anyone so I just kind of like completely ignored the issue didn't say to anyone and then 
I'd been going to the gym a lot at that time and I'd lost a lot of weight. Right. So I don't think that anyone really realised till it was really serious the amount of weight I was losing. Because, I mean, I've been... I'm about five foot eight. I've been this height since I was about 12, 13, I think. Mm-hmm. And I weighed about seven stone when I was admitted to hospital. That's how, like, much weight I'd lost. Um because it just eventually got to a point where I just couldn't attend school. My mum thought I'd caught some sort of like sickness and diarrhea bug, but I was like just in at advanced stages and a flare up. Right. She took me to the GP after like two weeks, I think, and the GP was just like no. So they admitted me because I hadn't told anyone I was admitted to the infectious disease ward at Monklands because they thought it might be an infectious disease. Right, okay. Because I was still lying to everyone and saying yeah. that I had, hadn't had symptoms till like two right. weeks ago. It was obviously really stupid. But um, then I think when I got there, I was given like a colonoscopy. So that's like a camera. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then... Up um, the butt. Yeah. Yes. Not pleasant. And, um, Do you get painkillers for that, or is it just like? Well, they give you sedation, right? So like, it's they they give you a supposed sedation, but I've never had a, a time where I felt sedated from it. If that makes sense. <laughs> right. Like, I was really lucky. Um, I was in York Hill for a few months, like after this. This uh-huh. is like, the, when I was first diagnosed, was it really? It was I was in mon- like hospital for months, like different hospitals. Mm-hmm. But I mean, at York Hill, they're like kind enough to. Um, give you a general anaesthetic when these things are happening which is much nicer yeah. but as an adult or like no sedation but honestly the sedation's not even worth it and see if you have the sedation then they make you stay and eat one of the nhs sandwiches so i usually just patch it because mm. don't even know if they cater for vegans and the nhs <laughs> <laughs> Um, were you told to like go vegan or anything like that or was that no they're really funny like I mean you know the advice I don't think the NHS are great at looking at like alternative therapies for things yes. like obviously I'd, I'm not I'm not completely saying that you know modern medicine is bad or anything like it obviously is helping I'll say me it. modern medicine is bad <laughs> I think like drugs are useful but I do think that there's other things that you can be doing in conjunction with that like um mm-hmm. For instance, I was sent to a dietitian when I was doing the whole paleo diet thing, and her advice to me was like, when I was having a flare up, that I should not eat any fruit or veg, only eat white bread, potatoes, like just all this stuff that's just absolutely shit for you. Yeah. So I was just kind of like, I don't think that that was really helpful. I think that would probably make me feel worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's interesting. So like, how, when was it? What you what uh year would you have been in school when you found out? I was in fourth year, so it conveniently happened um, just before all of my fourth year exams. So I was actually really annoyed with that as well because... Did you make any exams? No, I was actually in hospital because I was in Monklands for two weeks and then I think I got sent to York Hill for maybe another couple of weeks after they found out that it was Crohn's. Mm -hmm. And then my consultant at York Hill just sent me home with steroids and said, oh, it might not be Crohn's, even though the doctor at Monklands had said it's probably Crohn's. What do steroids do? Like, um, they just, it's it's so it's cortisol, kind of, you know, cortisol is like a stress hormone. I know nothing. Um, so 90% of what you're saying is going right <laughs> off my head. Like, um, when the body is like a fight or flight response, like cortisol is re- released, so that's like a stress hormone. Right, okay. But it's actually really useful in like reducing inflammation and repairing the body and stuff. Okay. So essentially like corticosteroids are like cortisol. Like a synthetic version yeah. of that, right, okay. So you have like cortisone, hydrocortisone, things like that. So um, And that was supposed to combat... It um, reduces inflammation. inflammation right, yeah, okay. it's just like in the short term, like it reduces inflammation, but also steroids also reduce your like immune system as right. well. So there was a point there for a while where I was on like three different types of immunosuppressor, and I was just like sick all the time. Jesus, it was not fun. That's terrible. And it's annoying as well because the struggle I get in Flexima because of how strong it is. If you contract any sort of infection or sore throat, then you're not allowed to get it. Why? Because like it would then get even worse after you get the ah, treatment. Okay. So that like there's a big like checklist they have to run through of like different things. Like do you have like a urinary tract infection? Like have you had any worsening of any mm-hmm. condition? That kind of thing. And also, if you take antibiotics, you're also not allowed to have it. Right. So I had 
been to the doctor, I think, a few days before it got antibiotics for a sore throat. The sore throat had cleared up. And when I went to get my infliximab, they were like, oh, no, you're on antibiotics. You can't get it. You'll need to wait two weeks. <laughs> so I was not well. It's That's not crazy. Good. So, uh, see, see, like, this might be a weird question, but see when, uh, when you get told you have something like this, is there, like, a support group or anything like that? Like, is there, like, a group of... I mean, I've never really been part of anything like that, but, I, I mean, I see how it would be useful. Is um, there anyone... Do you know anyone with the same stuff as you? Yeah, I know two people. There's a girl that I work with, actually, that um, just by chance we found out that both of us... I think she's not very, like, open in talking about the issues she has right. whereas I'm always quite vocal and working mm. about like things like that why do you think she's not very like open about it I think it's because it's quite an embarrassing condition and she was diagnosed more recently than I was I used to be quite embarrassed as well like if people asked me like what Crohn's disease was I used to be quite embarrassed because I mean it's kind of understandable I guess yeah, the, I, the I symptoms of it and things but yeah but the full point is that people shouldn't be embarrassed and yes, they should definitely they go to their gps and get checked out yes, if they have definitely. any crazy symptoms yeah i think especially is like it's something that seems to be on the rise in western europe at the minute especially which is quite interesting to me which is why i think the dietary angle is something that should be explored more how how does is it is there any origin to how you get it well they, they think that it's possibly genetic Right, but, but no one in your family has. No one in my family has Crohn's. A lot there are other. It's an autoimmune <clears throat> disease. There are other autoimmune diseases in my family. Like my sister has rheumatoid arthritis, and I think my f- mum has like an underactive thyroid and stuff. Right, like so they are all autoimmune diseases, but mm-hmm. they're not the same really, and no one really suffers from any like digestive issues in my family. So it's kind of odd. So like you're. A rare case, yes. or is that kind of like normal for people who kind of like not have any uh, family to have the same kind of thing? I think like normally people are meant to, it is meant to like follow a genetic line, but they also think that there are other, you know, factors. Like some people think that it's caused by like not um, having been exposed to enough germs as a child and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I have general like issues with my immune system i had chicken pox twice when i was a child so i don't actually have immunity to chicken pox so i think there's maybe like something quite what? not quite right with my immune system generally has anyone else ever had chicken pox twice oh it's, it's actually like a lot of people think you can only have chicken pox once but thought, yeah but it's kind of like it's not common but like it's i've met i think one other person who's had chicken pox twice that's crazy and uh, due to the same kind of thing or no i just i think you can take chicken pox mildly and then you can take it again and then only have a partial immunity because um when i was put on immunosuppressors they tested my blood for i think it was just to test like different immunities to different diseases so i've been told i need to be really careful with chicken pox because i only have partial immunity to it so right so you could effectively get it again yeah jeez oh and is that like in terms of like lots of different things you could just contract any well, kind of disease i can't stuff? get vaccinations for going on holiday like you can't get like see the typhus was, vaccination task, loads yeah. of things like that so Obviously, I travel quite a lot, but there are certain countries that I just couldn't go to because you're not allowed the vaccinations for them. And is that because <clears throat> you wouldn't actually build immunity to it, or is it because your body would react? It's because... You'd the, actually contract the disease. Yeah, you would contract the disease effectively because my immune system's so low with all the medication I'm taking. Like, if I were to get a vaccination, my body wouldn't, you know, like, fight yeah. it off in the same way, so I could potentially get ill from it. So... That means you, like, literally just couldn't go to a lot of countries. Yeah, there's loads of countries, like, well, I'm on this medication that I just can't go to. It's really sad. Yeah. It's sad because, like, for instance, my wee sister was in India last year and she was like, oh, you'd absolutely love to go to India. Well, there's just no way that I could go to India because she had to get, like, so many different vaccinations. Because you're, you're not Could you just go and... But then, see, the issue is because my immune system's weak, if I go and then, like, encounter that something. disease, yeah. then I would be, like, very unwell after that. That's, that's so devastating. I know. That's so sad. It is sad. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but there's still places that are cool that yeah. one does not need vaccinations to go to. I'm still trying to clarify if you need vaccinations to go to Japan because I've heard mixed reviews. What would the vaccinations mean? Well, somebody told me that you needed like this something that had like Japanese something in it. I'm not sure. But I was like, I feel like I've never heard anyone getting vaccinations to go to Japan. Nah. So I don't know. 
I'd take the risk. I'm, I'm sure they're the clean risk. people they've got. I mean, I'm sure all people good are water and clean stuff. Um, uh, that's really interesting. Though. So, like, <clears throat> going back to saying, like, you got, you got diagnosed when you were 14. Mm. And then, like, from then till now, how, like, completely different or how how relatively different is your life compared to just everyone else's that don't have what you have? Well, I think academically it's been a lot harder because, obviously, as I said, it's stress-related. Mm-hmm. So anytime I've had, like, anything stressful, which is normally related to, like, you know, going to uni exams, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Like, so you didn't do... Did you do any exams? Well, during... um, I missed all my fourth year exams and I put in... At that point, you could still do, like, medical appeals without having to pay for them. So right. I put in appeals and... Wait, f- you need to pay for medical appeals? I think nowadays, yeah, for high schools, you need to pay for your appeals and things, oh. which is a joke. Yeah. I'm not sure on that, but at the time, like, you could just do appeal or anything. And, I mean, I had got, like, all A's and 1's, like, in my prelims and they failed me on everything apart from art and English, which, I mean, it didn't affect me so badly because it was fourth year exams, but see, for instance, if I'd wanted to leave in fourth year, Mm. that would really have, like, fucked everything up. Mm -hmm. Like, it was really unfair. So you were really good at school? Yeah, like, I I actually was fine. Yeah. In fifth year, I had some issues because the medication is if I put that one can give you very bad nausea. So every morning I was waking up and I was like being sick like eight times and stuff. So I wasn't going into school till like 12 o'clock usually, things like that, missing a lot of school. But I'd say my Crohn's was quite under control that year and I ended up getting like five A's in my hires and stuff. Um, Then I left at the end of fifth year. And Why when, did you leave? Just weren't feeling it or because? Well, it's kind of difficult, I think, as well. It's you missing all the fourth year and stuff. I think a lot of people have, like, bonded and made friends with people and stuff socially. You kind of miss out on a lot of stuff and right. you just don't really feel... I felt kind of in fifth year a bit like I just didn't really want to be there that much. Mm-hmm. So I went to Edinburgh Uni straight after that, but, again, was really unwell, so I had to drop right. out after six months. Um... And at that point, I decided just to, like, take some time away from, like, education. And Mm -hmm. I actually had, like, a good... I think I had one small flare-up in the next three years. I was actually, like, completely... And to the point where I'd been working at my work for two years and I'd never had a sick day at all there. Right. Like, that's how good things were for a while. Um, Then, in 2017... I went back to uni, no, I'm trying to think what year is it now, no, 2016 I started at Glasgow Uni and then out of the blue took a massive epileptic seizure mm-hmm. and then was diagnosed with epilepsy like later on the next right. year. So I dropped out of uni again because like I was not very well for a while. Just... So did you just, you took a seizure and then instantly went? To your GP or, or doctor or whatever. Yeah, I think I had the seizure on the Friday and went to the GP on the Monday, but obviously right. it takes a while to be like referred and there's a lot uh-huh. of tests you need to go through. But I think that happened in October and I was diagnosed with epilepsy in May. But um, I've never taken medication for it since then and like I've never taken a seizure mm-hmm. since then. But I think it's just because like that's kind of forced me to change my lifestyle a lot more probably than anything else really up until that point. Because I was told, like, it, things like like binge drinking alcohol, for example, mm-hmm. not getting enough sleep, mm-hmm. um, not eating regularly, things like that, anything that puts your body under stress can trigger yeah. a seizure. So I was always quite careful after that with things like that. And then, obviously, I decided to go back to uni, so it was, like, my third try at uni. Mm-hmm. Um, Did you go to study the same thing every time? Uh, no, when I was 16, I went to study law at Edinburgh. Um, and then 2016, I was doing English Lit. And then 2017, I went back to do English Lit. And I don't even know how I've managed to do it, but somehow have managed to remain at uni this time. So I'm in halfway through okay. second year mm-hmm. now. But last year was definitely probably like the worst year for that because like in semester two of first year... I did not go to a single class. Like, I was not able to go to a single class because I was so unwell. And it was just, like, a year of, like, I was in the hospital twice last year for, like, a week each time. 
and on steroids constantly and like steroids are bad side effects with your mental health as well in terms of see how I said earlier the like stress hormones Mm -hmm. so that can make you feel really um, anxious or like irritable things like that like it can really mess with your mood a lot of the time when you're on high doses so I mean yeah it wasn't the best year last year I was in pain a lot of the time I couldn't concentrate on my uni work a lot but I mean I didn't set exams at all because I was in hospital first semester then second semester I got all B's I think in my exams but it was just annoying because I then had to go and like set my semester one exams in the reset diet which was like in August so I did not really get to enjoy my summer either mm, so right. it's just been a bit stressful do you think you're um like saying that the drugs kind of alter your personality or not your personality but your uh, your emotions and stuff do, <clears throat> do you think it has altered your personality do you think it's like changed the kind of person you are? I think the whole experience of like having a disability obviously affects like who you are. I think I mean experience is a general trauma, that kind of thing, obviously. Yeah. In the short term, steroids definitely made me like a much different person. And it was right. quite hard because I think in the long run that did have an effect because I was on them for a whole year. Do you think people understand what, what you were going through and what you are going through? I still don't think they do and no. it's like things and like relationships and stuff as well. It's quite hard. Like mm-hmm. you need to meet people, friends and like things who are going to be really understanding. My yeah. best friends, obviously, I've they've seen <clears throat> me when I've been at my worst and things but because mm-hmm. it is an invisible illness, I don't think people understand a lot of the time what's happening with it. Yeah. Um. For instance, I mean, my work have been very accommodating now, <coughs> but my manager at the time was quite rude about it and was saying yeah. things like, oh, we're trying to run a business here and stuff, you know. And didn't take it very seriously. Yeah, whereas um, my ops manager, her manager, um, has sorted it just basic things. Like, um, I have, like, a bathroom that's, like, got a lock on it and stuff that I basically am the only one that can use that, things like that. So, right. And... Obviously, being a bit more flexible with absences and things. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, like, because I work in a call centre, so I mainly do social media, but there was the odd occasion where I would have to have taken phone calls as well, which obviously when you have Crohn's is, like, not... It's not, like, a good thing. Like, if you're suffering a flare-up, you're on the phone to someone and then you need to use a bathroom, which is something that, like, my work didn't really seem to understand for a long time, which I didn't think was hard to really understand. But, um, I mean, they've been pretty accommodating now and I've been back at work since, like, August now I've been working again because I'd had to take a few months off and things. So like, have you have you lost friends and stuff like that due to this? I wouldn't say friends really. I mean it's difficult because I mean there's certain friends that I've probably distanced myself from due to I due think, to the way they've kind of reacted yeah, to Yeah, I think a lot of the time people have a reaction where they're trying to be positive, but it's kind of like this toxic positivity yeah. where they tell you that you can't be sad about anything, mm-hmm. which I really don't think is helpful. Like, yeah. I know obviously we don't want to all be sitting being depressed all the time mm-hmm. about things, and you need to you do need to find look for positivity and things, but I don't think it's helpful to tell someone, like, oh, you can't complain about this, you can't complain about that. It's, it's just not a helpful attitude. Yeah. And definitely with, like romantic partners I definitely think that that's like a big thing like there's been quite a few girls where like I've been seeing them for a while and then they've said things that have sparked arguments like or like just general things like that just not being understanding about mm-hmm. it and stuff I think that's probably more difficult than like with friends yeah that's interesting um do you think like the NHS and stuff have, have done a lot like do you think they're very helpful and and like do they explain it very well and stuff or are they kind of like we don't really know we don't know how to help you (laughs) do you know what I mean see I think that I've been quite lucky in the team that I have Mm -hmm. um I'm with a team at Wishaw General so and they're all specialists within this like yeah so you have everyone's meant to be assigned to uh so you have obviously your consultant who's like your main doctor right and there's a team at Wishaw I think they go between Wish and a couple of other hospitals of like specialist inflammatory bowel disease nurses. So they're kind of like very good at what they're doing as well. So you can speak to like either of them, mm-hmm. however you can get in touch with. But um, I mean. Do you have them on like on your phone so you can just text them anytime? I actually do. I mean, it's not so much they have like a phone number and you leave a voicemail <laughs> and they'll call you back. That right, week. okay. 
um, or I also have my consultant has his secretary and you can leave like a message say if you need like if, I, if I'm needing like a letter for uni that kind of thing right. like I needed a letter recently for going to Spain because mm-hmm. for insurance reasons the uni needed him to say that I was fine to go um, that which is quite good but I mean I know some of my friends my friend that I mentioned at work she's with a different team also at Wisho and her consultant's not even like referred her to the nurses or anything which right. everyone who has inflammatory bowel disease and is in adult services is meant to be in, be contact, in contact with, with them right. like it's really quite bad so I think it would really just depend who your yeah. consultant was I know at York Hill the consultant I had when I was younger was quite terrible um, he just sent me home with steroids and said that just the column if I got sick again <laughs> and when mom tried to phone saying that I was drastically not well again yeah. he was on holiday so I ch- eventually had to just bring me to the A&E at York Hill and present me to say like she's a patient so it was a bit of a mess but I think it just depends really on who you have as your doctor yeah. so uh, going back to the did you hear that? I thought that was I honestly thought that was just in the headset. I was like, oh no, the bro. Um going back to the seizures and the epilepsy. Yeah. So what was the what actually triggered that the first time? I'm not really sure to be honest. Like I'd been on a night out and it was quite late at night, so I think it was um I actually hadn't been drinking that night or anything though, because it was through in Edinburgh and I'd brought my car. Mm-hmm. Um I was with about three of my friends or something. But I mean, I think it'd been one of those weekends. I'm not a lot, not a lot of sleep because yeah. I've been out. Like I used to like techno quite a lot, and like I used to go out to clubs quite often. Mm-hmm. Um, we were at back at my friend's flat, and I went to walk my other friend to his girlfriend's car. Cause she was there to pick them up, and I just don't remember anything after that for about forty minutes. Jeez, oh. so, so I was outside when it happened. Yeah, I was actually on a like. I mean, it was a road, not a busy road or anything. Like it was yeah. like three in the morning, but um. I don't really remember anything past like going down the stairs of the flat, but apparently I just like had dropped in the road and like was having a fit for like a minute and a half or something roughly. Did your friends know how like well help you out? Not and stuff really. No, like, I mean they like had no idea they were on. really kind of like a bit bewildered. Like nobody phoned an ambulance or anything. I think it was just like nobody really knew what was going on. Yeah. But then apparently I was conscious after this, but I just didn't. Just really reco- I didn't really recognise right. anyone and I was like quite agitated like I was like didn't know where I was or anything mm-hmm. and um, I think they'd asked me like a f- questions I just wasn't like giving coherent answers but the next thing that like I remember is like being in my friend's bed and she was kind of like um, sort of like fussing over me and I was like what are you doing and then she was like oh you've just had a fit and then sort of like slowly after that I started to realise that, like, my head was really sore. Like, I'd bitten, like, through the side of my tongue as well. Right. And there was, like, cuts all over my legs. So it was, like, just, like, a really weird experience. Mm-hmm. Um, not fun. That's crazy. That's but, like, so thankfully, it's not something, like, I know... I've known people, for instance, at uni who have, like, seizures every week and things like that. Luckily, it's not yeah. something... I think mine is easily controlled by just looking after myself to be honest with you um and you said that you uh before we started recording you said that you went to the hospital and they tried to like trigger a seizure oh this to, was such, a, it was what such a bizarre was. like it was a very <laughs> bizarre so this was maybe i think my seizure was in october and this was in may mm-hmm. um i'd been sent for like an mri just to check that i didn't have any like growth on my brain or anything right. so that was clear which can generally cause yeah seizures, like, yeah, yeah if you've got a tumor or anything mm-hmm. like that even if it's benign that can cause mm-hmm. seizures so my mri was absolutely fine they also do like an ecg which is like a test of your heart because i think um issues with your heart can also cause seizures as well which I actually didn't know until that what, point. What is an ECG? Like, what does it look like? An ECG is just when they put um, sort of, like, electrodes all over yeah. your chest and it just sort of monitors your heart rate. I, I think. got that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so mine was also fine. They were like, everything's absolutely fine that way. So then they were like, right, we'll send you for an EEG, which is similar to an ECG, but obviously it's your brainwave. So right. you go in, and I went to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital mm. in Glasgow for it, um, and... 
they have like a big armchair and like a film camera it's all set up so <laughs> I was <laughs> the guy was like yeah we're just filming this in case you have a seizure and then we'll be able to record it and I was just like all right so is this right now a bit like PTSD oh yeah so it's like the armchair was like there <laughs> and the camera was there and then um so it was just a bit odd because like they kind of go around and like scratch your head and then <laughs> put this sort of like cold gel yeah. and stick electrodes like all over your head everywhere like trying here. to induce a seizure it's just to, so that's for the monitor and all and then after that um they begin and they're like it's different things like breathing exercises and stuff um i can't remember exactly one of them was like a weird breathing exercise where you had to like breathe in really quickly and then do then do like big massive exhales so and stuff. what what like I understand it's like they're trying to make you take a seizure but how does that make you take a seizure I'm not really sure like I it's think trying it's to confuse the brain and... or to like stress the body right. perhaps like it's to monitor like essentially the electrodes <laughs> on your head monitor the electrical activity in mm-hmm. your brain and then they obviously get a reading on that and they'll know what's normal and stuff right. so there was a few different things but like one of them involved like just staring into a strobe light for <laughs> like a good five minutes and then after that um i was like cool i just had to go after that and then apparently that had showed that like there was like abnormal spikes of activity so they can tell if you're like prone to having another seizure but i mean diagnosis diagnosis of epilepsy is like a weird thing because um it just means unexplained seizures really like there's loads of different causes for it and loads of different... It just means that you're more prone to having seizures than other people. There's a woman that I work with, for example, who's, like, an older woman, and she had epilepsy from, like, the age of seven, I think, and then when she was 50, just stopped having seizures. Really? Oh, and she's, like, 59 now and hasn't had a seizure. That's interesting. So it's just, like, maybe her brain just connected the right way or, yeah, or something? Yeah, it's very odd. Because um, seizure, seizures are essentially just, like when your body doesn't really know how to react or your mind doesn't really know how to react to something that re- reacts improperly right yeah i think it's just like when your brain is like overloaded by yeah. like electrical impulses and then it's just you know yeah wild well uh we've been talking for 40 minutes 40 minutes yeah is there anything you want to say anything you want to bring up um i don't know lucy do you have any questions nothing <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think that's yes. I think that's pretty good. That's good. Got any closing words? Anything you want to plug? Um, you should follow my band on Instagram. Link in the description. Well, yeah, link in description. We're called Maya Maya, and um, I like to think we're excellent. Do you have any recorded songs? right now well we've recorded one song we're currently making a music video but there have been some issues due to the weather recently as it's been filmed outside and um the star of our video fraser shaved his beard off over (laughs) christmas so we need to wait for that to grow back until we can film the rest where can people listen to your music right now um we have well we're kind of just starting out initially we have a few wee live videos on instagram but if you keep following us, then soon we should be releasing an EP. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Tom. Uh, no, thank you very much for coming and telling us lots of interesting stuff about what you've been yes. through. And yeah. So what's next? What are you doing next? Um, well, yeah, and to get through the this set of exams... And then after that, I'll have a whole eight months in Spain and I only need to work 12 hours a week. So, sounds good. Honestly, I think the sun will do me wonders. No stress in Spain. Awesome. Thanks for watching episode two of Volumes. If you enjoyed, please let me know. Comment if you have any suggestions who I should talk to next or what I should talk about next. If you're listening to this podcast and want to watch it, it's also available on YouTube. And if you're watching that and want to listen to it, it's also available on SoundCloud. Please remember to like and subscribe or follow if you're on SoundCloud. And all the things mentioned in this episode will be in the description. All the links to Clara's stuff will be there as well. And yeah, thanks for watching.